For at TV, the world is thinking. In the last maybe 10 more minutes or so, I want to just sum up an application of learning about what's in our backyard to some conservation issues and just fun discovery in Madagascar. Now, before we begin, you have to kind of get in the mindset of being a taxonomist. This is what we do at this museum, be a taxonomist. And we ask these very instance, simple questions. What living things exist? Where do they live? And as I said, for me, that means going out like Madagascar, running around and digging into rotten logs, looking for ants in the nest, and coming back with this like holy grail, the ant. We mount them onto a little paper cardboard point. We label them. Then we measure their ant heads and we delimit them as a species or identify them. In the old days, as Dan mentioned, you spent your entire life producing this one work that, in which you described all these new species. In other words, you stayed alone in your office for about 30 years and produced this. Now, we didn't mind doing that because we had this idea that our legacy would be these pinned ants we call the holotype. That one specimen that bears the name of a new species, it's called the holotype. But there's a problem. For the last 250 years, since the time of Linnaeus, all these products of taxonomists have never been used. And therefore, not valued, not cared for, not encouraged, not, nobody's clamoring for taxonomists. And they also turned to museums where taxonomists work as simply a warehouse of dead creatures and not actually a portal into life to understanding and to actually management of the planet Earth. So you could say, well, things change, it's a crisis, and maybe taxonomists just die out. I want to convince you that no, it's not going to die out. We're in the middle of this incredible breakthrough, but we do have problems. For one, Dan mentioned this too, taxonomists are dying. Not me personally, but a lot of taxonomists are quite old. Well, does this matter, you could say? Well, if you study birds, less so, most of the birds have been discovered and described for a while. But if you like these things, like this, this is an ant, hopefully you know that by now. These ants, we know so little. We're in trouble. But 10% of all life on this planet, the insects, have been described. Again, you're asking, why does this matter? I still get my coffee in the morning. Things are going OK. The problem is the bulk of diversity, the bulk of what an ecosystem is, those processes in which we depend on are driven by the insects. You could remove, probably, all the birds of a forest and still have a forest. But the insects are essential. So let's review. Lots of undescribed species, fewer taxonomists. But on top of that now, we have this new phenomena the suicidal experiment of rapid deforestation, habitat modification, combined with climate change. Now, climate change, does it exist? <laughs> it was quite contentious in the last administration, but we responded by presenting evidence that clearly showed climate change is reality. And I think thanks to this relationship now, I think humans on the one hand see there's a link between what we do and the environment. For the first time we're making, we're connecting the dots. So what we need, really, is some type of Dow Jones index to the environment, where we can actually judge and evaluate where we put a school, where we put a farm, where we put our actions in the environment. Real time to be able to make a, a conscious decision. We're a long way from that. One part of that is bioliteracy. Now, what is that? Well, if you're illiterate and you go to a library, what do you see? At most, you'll see thinly sliced stacks of firewood. You won't see anything or appreciate the value of a library. Now, if you're bioilliterate and you see a forest, what do you see? But a green blob to be cut down, to put cows on. You can't read it. You can't understand it. You can't evaluate it. You can't judge it. And that's important. So somehow. We need to increase bioliteracy. As we increase literacy, bioliteracy decreases, and it's our job, like at the Cal Academy, to change that. So to Madagascar, where ants will play a role. Now, just a little brief history of Madagascar. It was attached to Africa about 120 million years ago, broke away along with India. India broke away about 80 million years ago, going north, dropping the Seychelles, hitting Asia, creating the Himalayas. The long isolation of Madagascar has resulted in an incredible fauna where there's 
primates, lemurs, found only in Madagascar. Everything there is basically unique to Madagascar. And more shocking is that they've taken on all these bizarre forms. Some of them are like ancient lineages that have persisted in Madagascar that have gone extinct elsewhere. We have all these beautiful, only found creatures in Madagascar. Now, if you were in Africa and popped over to Madagascar, you'd be shocked what you don't find there. You find none of the venomous snakes, the ungulates, the elephants, the hippos. You won't find any of the pythons. This is a python uh, we had to collect, actually, recently in Gabon. Had a round of food for about six days, so we had to kill it. Now, if you like ribs, um, python's the way to go. We had ribs for about another four days. <laughs> now, and the driver ants, these dominant ants of Africa and Asia, are completely absent from Madagascar because they never got there. Madagascar was sheltered and isolated from all these fancy New Age evolution events that were happening elsewhere. So Madagascar is an important piece of, of the puzzle for life on the planet. And on top of that, in Madagascar, it's like a model continent. You have in the east coast, rainforest, the west coast, dry forest, and the south, an incredible desert. Now, unfortunately, the, 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 like many recently colonized places, the people that arrived there brought some of the most destructive land use practices. They brought rice cultivation from Asia, cattle herding from Africa, and the end result is rapid deforestation. About 10% of the habitat is left. And the, kind of the challenge, and the government has challenged us in a sense, to choose between the remaining patches of forest in Madagascar to put together a network of parks that preserve the greatest number of species. And that's our current challenge, and that's our race against time. Now, what data do we have? We may have a few birds data, but what we really need is fine-scale data like insects. And that's what we're doing in Madagascar, is going out there and providing insect data to make these decisions. Now, getting out there and doing this is quite a challenge. It takes over half the time just to get, get to each of the sites we visit. So we've become experts in vehicle recovery and finding those patches of forest, digging ourselves out, wondering how we're going to get across each river. Sometimes we make the wrong decision. But we have the new inventions. We have this one with the inflatable raft. Now, if you've ever gotten on into a pool on a raft and had the raft go, fring, um, that happens on this, so we changed it and invented this. Um, <laughs> where you have, uh, you can, these are portable little drums you can take around with you. you can, not so useful in the Bay Area, but in Africa it's pretty useful. And then when you finally get to this town or the village, you have to start to hike. These last trips in Madagascar, a couple months ago, we were hiking 50 kilometers just to get to the patch of forest. And there we work, and we walk in a sequence. So there, this is 19th century expedition biology. And once we're there, as you learned in the little video, we go through a series of traps. And the real fun is trying to invent new ways. We work with a group in France to get to the canopy, where we you know, pull up a balloon in the morning. They drag us around and into bushes and say, hey, can you grab some ants? Another fun one was like this uh, carnival balloons with pantyhose in between. You drop onto the canopy, and you live up there for a couple weeks reaching into the forest to get all these new species. As it turns out, ants and insects are abundant. We got lots of them, and we had to learn how to process them. So we develop a team in Madagascar, about 15 people, that help us process this material, identify it, and we ship it off to 180 taxonomists around the world. This has evolved into a Madagascar Biodiversity Center located in the zoo in Madagascar. Stop by and visit. And it's where we, have, we teach, we emphasize education, at the university, education of children at the, uh, the zoo, and also our research program there. And on top of that, we realized that we had to do more than that. We had a big project in, um, is called AntWeb, in which we decided to put all our information about ants of the world, and we're slowly getting through it, starting with Madagascar. And funny thing is that this one project devoted to science has helped and, and given you a window into the world of ants. And now we're developing handheld devices that you can walk around in, the, in Golden Gate Park, check out the local ants, download a little picture guide of the ants nearby, so you'll never have a fear of being without ants. <laughs> Just going to end basically on some new, new techniques we're using. One is called DNA barcoding, which helps us speed up the process of identification and also getting data into the hands of conservation biologists. DNA is just one short sequence of DNA we sequence, but we sequence Lots of specimens. We're about 12, 000, or 15,000 specimens now we've sequenced, in which, in the beginning, we had to kind of challenge ourselves, would it work? But yes, it does. You can actually 
get the same results in terms of biodiversity assessment of taking samples and sending it down like the morphological route versus the DNA route. And it's been a great boom. And we now we even describe, and uh, there's people from PLOS here, actually this is a figure from the PLOS journal, in which we described ants um, using genetic descriptions. And because Claire Kremen is here in the audience too, she was the first author on this analysis in which we used a multi-taxonomic analysis, basically the first time to assess which of those areas in Madagascar would capture the most diversity. So it's a long story to end on, but it's the beginning point is that first step out the door to go look for these creatures and to look at them with eyes wide open and an appreciation that maybe they are important to us. And we have to start now, and we can before it's too late, make a difference. So thank you, and please join us if you care in our efforts in Madagascar. Thank you.